and welcome to the 34th annual United States Army Band 2B Podium Workshop. I'm Sergeant First Class Adam Lassard, and I'm the Assistant Chairman for this year's workshop. And it's my pleasure to introduce our, uh, our honored guest this morning. I have a couple of announcements before I do, and uh, he doesn't have that much time for the warm-up, so I'm going to be quick with these. Uh, the exhibits are opening on Friday at noon, so n Friday at noon to 5.30, Saturday from 9 to 5.30. It's in your program, but I just wanted to remind you. Um, also, uh, two things. We are, we are going to be having two social events after the orchestra concert. One after the orchestra concert, we're doing a bowling night at the bowling alley, just uh, three doors down. Just walk down the, uh, the sidewalk out here, turn right, and uh, go down until you get to the bowling alley. That'll be after the orchestra concert tomorrow night. And on Saturday, after the grand concert, we're doing a reception at the community center, which is where the exhibits are being um, set up uh, this afternoon. And uh, last, um, for any of the military folks that we have here, I want to remind everybody that we are, uh, we are having AFKI again this year. We're uh, bringing it back. And the rehearsals, in case, because uh, they're not printed in our program, in case you didn't get the memo, the rehearsals are today from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, or 1800 to 1900, and uh, tomorrow from 1500 to 1630. And then the performance is on Saturday at 1500. All right, so we really want uh, our, our military folks to, to take part in that, um, and let's boost the numbers back up for that as we, uh, as we bring it back. All right, our honored guest this morning is a student of Dan Parentoni, Phil Cinder, and Dave Federley. Um, I had the pleasure in my youth of, uh, of attending Interlochen one summer with him, so that's where I met uh, Dr. Kevin Sanders. He's now the professor of tuba and euphonium at the University of Memphis, so please give him a big hand. Let's dive right into this and uh, go ahead and there's all these seats on the front row. So at a tuba conference, you always know the back rows are going to be filled. It's just like we gravitate towards those spots. Um, does anybody care if I don't use the microphone? Can everyone hear me fine? Okay, great. So, I, you know, I wanted to start out, these warm-up classes, they always kind of confuse me because um, I'm never really sure if we're talking about warm-ups or if we're talking about fundamentals. So, I was, I was curious if any of you guys want to share, um, you know, what do you think a warm-up, what's the point? Or this thing we do when we first get up in the, in the morning and pick up our horn. Anybody want to volunteer their thoughts on that? Mental and physical focus. Mental and physical focus? Yeah, so just like kind of getting your brain engaged on the horn. Good, good. Anything else? Get your chops going? Yeah, definitely. Um, any other takers? I think those are all right answers. I, You know, the there's a couple things. Um, you know, the way I, I think about it, there are there are things we do to get our chops going, and then I feel like there are things that we do, um, and this is where I, I call it fundamentals and not so much a warm-up, to continue and advance like the very basic things that we do on the horn. So, 8 a.m. confessions for me, I don't really have a Kevin Sanders warm-up that I do every single day. I have a short attention span, um, and so my warm-up changes a lot. and. Uh, and most, most mornings, I warm up on Rochus, or I love that Phil Schnedeker uh, lyrical etudes for trumpet, just some really beautiful music to just enjoy. But <clears throat> there are some times where uh, I, gotta, I gotta work on the fundamental part. I'll give you a great example. Um, I just started growing this beard about five weeks ago. My wife has been very kind to me and let me do this. <laughs> and. Uh, Interestingly enough, it's the first time I've ever grown anything. My, my freshman roommate in college had to teach me how to shave, so this is a big deal. Um, and so as, the, as it grew in, it was more and more difficult for me to play in the low range, which has always been something that, that has been one of the better things that I do. So uh, going back to some of these exercises I'm going to show you today has, has helped me kind of uh, uh, figure out how to, how to play down there a little bit. Uh, again with all this facial hair. Okay, so uh, what you see up here, this is a packet that I give my students. This is not something that I, I force them to do. This is just kind of like a, 
a, a starting ground. A lot of the, the students I get, they're, they're music ed majors, and a lot of them don't really have a routine yet, so this is kind of a, an intro to several different um, exercises from lots of different books, and I just kind of picked my favorite ones. And uh, I know there's a recital in here at 9 a.m., so I'm hoping we can give that guy a little bit of time and get out of here maybe five or ten minutes early for his sake. So, uh, oh yeah, that's me. I'm pushing the button. Oh, is it? First things first. Uh, one of the first things I do when I pick up the horn is I, I do a little bit of buzzing. And one of my very favorite buzzing exercises is uh, from the Brass Gym, from Pat and Sam's Brass Gym. And uh, so if you guys want, this is participatory. You grab your mouthpieces and we'll do this. I'll give you some real talk. I, uh, when I was in school, I was never able to buzz, and then I was 25 years old, and I, I went to a, uh, a clinic that Pat Sheridan did, and I saw him do his buzz thing, where he buzzed from a low F, you know, all over the place, and uh, my, my jaw kind of dropped, and so I was like, I, I have to be able to do that, and so if buzzing is not a, a strong suit of yours, I can tell you that it is definitely something you can learn how to do. So uh, my favorite exercise on here is the very first one. And uh, we can take it uh, in any key. We'll just pick F for now. And then pick a, pick a comfortable F. So there's our pitch. And let's find it. Let's hum it real quick. Now let's buzz it. So we're going to just go and we're going to do the exercise and a couple things. So what you're listening to me do is I'm, I'm really trying to put a ton of glissando between all the notes. And that's why we're, we're trying to connect, we're trying to connect everything here. Now one of the best analogies I've heard for this is you know, a lot of times younger players, when they think about slurring, they think about slurring it on a brass instrument like, oh, 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 and they do this little bit of cushion with their airstream. Oh, oh, when you listen to a singer, or if you sang that, oh, 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 and if we slowed that down, we'd hear, oh, we'd hear glissando in our voice. And so we want to replicate that on the buzz. And so that's, that's how we get these liquid slurs. So let's, uh, let's do this exercise real quick. Pick your comfortable F, let's hear your F again, and I'll guide you with the pitch on the piano. Here we go. Nice big breath. two or three. Um, so if you did that in the upper range, or if you did that in the lower range, pick, pick a different register, and let's do one more scale. You want to pick a scale for us? We just did F. Uh, C major. C major? Good one, good one. So here's our C major. Let's do this one. Pick a different register from where you just were at. Let's play that first pitch. Excellent. Here we go.
Excellent. So, um, you know, that's a great thing just to get some blood flow into the chops and also start tying our ear to what our, what our lips are doing. Uh, the next thing, next thing is uh, we can put our horns down if you guys want to stand up for this. I'm not going to do a, a ton of this this morning, but this is just a couple of uh, stretches and, and a couple things like this. <coughs> Yeah, I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, this is good. I mean, uh, to give you an example, I, the hotel bed I slept on last night, I've got a, a crick in my neck uh, this morning. And so uh, that's the last thing that I want to bring into, into my sound when I, when I play this morning. So uh, I love some of these stretches because I feel like uh, they do a really great job of, of getting us loose before we really start moving some air and, and uh, making, making some noise. So first things first. Um, we can do any of these in any sort of, of way, but let's start out with trunk twists and uh, we'll put our arms to the side. I'm sure most of us know this and we're all gonna look stupid together. Here we go. Let's just start twisting. And if you can, start doing some nice relaxed breaths and exhaling as you go all the way to the left or right. Good, 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 good. Roll your shoulders. Excellent. Now let's take our, our arm and drape it across our chest like this. And make sure as you do this that you're not flexing your shoulders or your arms or anything like that. Keep everything loose. And then as we do this, keep that deep, slow breathing going because that's part of the stretch. Give me two more deep breaths like that. One more. Excellent. Roll that out of your arm. Shake it out. And then swap real quick. Same thing. Give me three deep breaths. Just feel your body drop like two inches while we do these. Excellent. Roll that out of your shoulder. Good, we'll do two more stretches. Let's take our hand and let's pull down on our right wrist with our left hand, pull down. And then as we do that, let's roll our head from ear to shoulder. Nice and slow, nice and slow. Don't rip your head off or anything. And again, the breathing is a part of the stretching. So this should be your moment of Zen before you play any notes. The slower the better. Good, roll that out of your shoulder and switch, pull down on your left wrist. Same thing. This is really great because the tension that we bring in our body every day is one of the, one of the two variables that we have every single morning when we play, so it's good to address that. Let's go ahead and stretch that out. And then last stretch, this is one of my favorites, I think it's really good. Let's put our arms up over our head like this, if you can, and look straight ahead while you do it. Don't look down, look straight ahead. And then let's do a couple of nice deep breaths. This is really good for our upper body, and the neck and shoulders. Good, let that drop, roll it out switch. Let's do the last one. Same thing. Look straight ahead. Give me three deep breaths. Last deep breath. Good. Let that drop. Whose shoulders feel just a little bit heavier than they did two, three, four minutes ago? Yeah. So, and if they don't, then there's several other exercises on here to do, but the important thing is when you're doing this is to make sure that you're not flexing or anything like that. You're just, you're keeping everything loose so you can get a, a maximum stretch. Excellent. All right, go ahead and sit down. Let's play some notes.
this first exercise, uh, this is nothing more than just a simple, simple flow exercise. And uh, it's kind of great for having it be the first thing. It's in a comfortable register. It really teaches you to kind of blow across uh, that octave. And then you can just focus on really, really easy, relaxed air. Um, so let me just demonstrate the very first set of this, and then we'll play it as a group. So you can go ahead and... Number one, air it out. exercises, right? I mean, they've been around for decades. So it's not so much about what you do, but it's about how you play it, right? And I mean, we all know people that have practiced long tones or done the beautiful exercise and sound that, that we're going to do in a second that have done it for 10 years. And, and some people's sounds get better and some people's sounds never, ever change. So it's it's uh, really about how you practice the exercise and the things you're, you're focusing on and thinking about while you do it. Um, so for this exercise, I mean, obviously, we try to keep a beautiful sound in our head, but so much of it for me is about um, making sure the air is coming <coughs> from my chest and not from my stomach, that it's just one big collapse from here. And the guys on this side of the room, uh, they could probably see my chest collapsing while I, while I played the exercise. And if, if it comes from here, I know it's not going to be under pressure. So uh, that's, that's one of the things that I, I just kind of make sure that it's one big sigh throughout the whole exercise and that there's not any notes that I'm trying to goose or muscle or punch or anything like that. It's all happening with easy air and, and buzz. So let's, uh, let's try that as a group. We got the four click intro and then right into the exercise and so uh, using those four clicks to get a great great breath is always a good idea let's go for it number one air it out Using really, really relaxed air, 
and uh, trying to keep it beautiful throughout all the registers. And uh, especially for younger players when we're first starting to kind of like uh, get on this, um, you know, really focusing on sound, it's uh, one of the great things about this exercise is that we can really start to clone our good notes. You know, for a lot of people, a low B flat or a B flat is a, it's a good note. You've been playing it since you were in fifth, sixth grade, right? So being able to take the sound of a B flat and make your B natural or your C or your D flat, some of these more awkward fingerings, and focusing on making that just as beautiful as your B flat, um, that's where I think an exercise like this really, really comes in handy. So um, if, you could, if you could play the, this first track, I'll demonstrate here just a drone and uh, and a, a drum beat.
So, you know, you heard the, the track that was with this. This is just something I made in GarageBand on the Mac. It was just a drum beat, and I there's a there's a really awesome uh, <coughs> drone CD. You, I think you can still buy it on iTunes. It's just cello drones, and it's, uh, it's really uh, pretty cool. And uh, so I just use cello sounds for the drone. And this goes back to how easily I can get bored and uh, just trying to keep myself entertained. And, and uh, you know, you don't always have a, a buddy to play warm-ups with or something like that. And so this is a, a good way to not only have a, a reference point for pitch and time, but uh, just to keep your, your brain engaged on one more level. <coughs> All right. So this exercise, um, sound, this is another one from the Michael Davis book. And I... Uh, Truth be told, it's not my favorite exercise, but if I feel like this is kind of like vegetables. It's, it's, you gotta eat them. And the reason why this is something that I like to practice is because, um, you know, so often we have really, really pretty sounds in mezzo forte and, and even like mezzo piano and piano. And then all of a sudden, when we get up to forte, fortissimo, triple F, all of a sudden our sound oftentimes takes on like this trombone like you know, uncharacteristic sound. And so this is just a really great exercise to work on the extremes of the register and, uh, and to make sure that as you get loud, the air comes from here and not from down here. And so when you're at your max, when you're at forte fortissimo, um, that you're still in that, uh, I like to call it the deflation sensation. You're still feeling everything coming out of your body like it's nice and easy and that it, it's not, we're not pushing from down here. Because when we push from down here, that's when the sound starts to crumple up and, uh, and get ugly. So um, I don't think this exercise necessarily needs to be demonstrated, but it's just uh, we're going to do this as a group. And we start out as soft as we can, and then we breathe quickly, and then we come in as loud as we can and decrescendo to nothing. <clears throat> this. Uh, this exercise, the, be, where I saw it before I found it in the Michael Davis book, I saw it in uh, Charlie Vernon's uh, Daily Routines for the Trombone. It's a, uh, this is a really great exercise out of that book, so I've uh, got to give him a little bit of credit for that. Um, all right, so let's do, let's do this one. Most of their playing, you know, uh, by themselves, 
or in, in chamber groups because this, this really helps remind us that we do have this nice big sound and it doesn't always have to be conformed to the, the tiny room that we play in. So this kind of keeps, I like to call it dynamic flexibility. It keeps everything loose and, and allows us to have a, a nice big dynamic range. Uh, so this next exercise, we're not going to play as a group, but I just thought I would be remiss if I didn't talk about it for a second. Um, this long tones exercise is not anything crazy. It's basically a Remington, Remington long tones study. But uh, I wanted to talk for just a really quick second about um, how David Federley had me do this exercise when I was studying with him uh, for graduate school. And uh, it really, the way I did the exercise and the way he explained it helped me tremendously with homogenizing my sound and, and giving me the same sound on every note and also helping me with pitch. So this is not something you can really do as a group. It's, it's kind of something you have to do on your own. But uh, the way you do the exercise is you have the tuner on your stand and then you find your favorite note, whether that's B flat or F or you know, usually an open tone. And, uh, and you close your eyes and you try to make the most beautiful, round, open sounds you can. And once you feel like you have hit that sweet spot on the horn, you open your eyes and you see where you're at on the tuner. And if the tuner is too flat, oftentimes that means you've got a lot of dullness in your sound. If the tuner is too sharp, oftentimes that means that uh, there's a lot of E in your sound. And so uh, you allow your ears to train your sound with where the sweet spot on the horn is gonna be. And I will tell you, the first time you do this exercise, it can be uh, pretty disheartening because you're finding out what your tendencies are all over the horn, but it's, it's really cool. When you do it daily, it becomes faster and faster and faster because you're acclimating your ear to, to where the sweet spot is. And then on top of finding the sweet spot of the horn, obviously, you're learning to play with really, really great pitch. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful way to work on, on long tones. And, and uh, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever uh, heard a, a band director or a teacher talk about visual tuning as opposed to, to audible tuning. But visual tuning is when you stare at the, the uh, tuner and then you're like, oh, I'm 30 cents sharp. And so you just lip up until you're right in the middle. And yeah, you're in tune, but your sound sucks. So who cares, right? And so this exercise, uh, it kind of allows you to give the best of both worlds. And it allows you to play with a beautiful sound and also um, uh, fix the pitch. And you do that throughout your entire register and, uh, and you can really start to develop that relaxed O sound all over the horn. So uh, that's something that, that had a really, really big impact on me when I was in school. And so I just wanted to share that. But that's, that's definitely a, the kind of exercise you want to do on your own. Okay, so this is an accuracy of attack exercise. This is where we, we start working with our, our tongue. I like to do this exercise three times in a row in uh, three different octaves. But um, while we do this exercise, you know, just think about, again, think about sound. And so if, uh, if you have a tendency to tongue too hard, I would recommend um, playing through some of this exercise breath attacked and just remind yourself uh, how effortless these notes can come out, right? So let's, um, let's go ahead. I'll play just the first couple of measures of this. Number 10, interval attacks. like we did the uh, the flow exercises at the beginning try to make sure you're not reaching for any of the notes and that's that's one of the things sometimes our tongue can can stop our airstream and and force us to do these explosions of air so that's why the breath attack is sometimes a good thing on this exercise um, but just make sure that that no matter where we're at on the horn um, 
we keep it easy. And we're not, again, we're not using our, our, uh, our muscles to force out a note. So we'll, uh, let's do this exercise twice and we'll do it as written the first time. The second time you can choose to go up or you can choose to, to go down. So here's the, here's the first time. Number 10, interval attacks. those to make sure that that we're always uh, we're always getting better at that stuff oh yeah so here I got a little bit of a little bit of song and wind in here and uh, this is just a really simple uh, etude that I took from the uh, Chimera book for trombone and I think yeah so let's do number 21 and this is, this is an exercise that um, sometimes I might play it a couple times. Oh, got it, okay. I might play it a couple times and uh, uh, in any different, any different register. So um, pick your octave and, uh, and let's, let's end with a little bit of song. Four beat intro. This is number 21. <coughs> into your routine to remind yourself, I am a musician at the end of the day, uh, I think is really, really great. 
So let's, uh, we'll skip the flexibility and uh, we'll skip that. Let's do this articulation exercise. This is, uh, this is really, really great because the way this exercise is lined up, it forces you to use a light tongue. You can't hammer on this exercise because it is so repetitive. And, uh, and then it's also great for lining up our fingers. So um, if, I can, if I can demonstrate that real quick, just keep things nice and easy. Yeah. So just nice and easy. And if and if this is too difficult, break the rhythm up. You can do that. So here we go. Let's play. It's uh, one of the ways I like to work on it that really helps develop uh, down in that register is to bend into each pitch. So we demonstrate like... And so on and so forth, all the way down in the register. And so that forces us to buzz in between these really awkward intervals as we get lower and lower. So... I haven't been cut off yet. Let's let's close with this exercise. This is a great warm down after what we just did. So it'll be two beats of intro and then and then we come in. Nice and slow, bend into each pitch. Here's two beats of breath. Here we go. Thank you. 
warmed up some of it will will challenge you and uh, and improve your articulations or your low range or your high range or your flexibility and um, you know hopefully I gave you a couple of uh, things to think about as you go through the warm-up so thank you for being here at 8 a.m. I very much appreciate it you never know who's gonna be here and uh, I hope you guys had as much fun as I did thank you very much
Oh, there we go. Good morning, folks. How are you all doing? Thank you for coming out, uh, especially those that were in the warm-up session and staying a little extra time here. A uh, couple of announcements to make. Uh, the first has to do, I don't know if you're in military members here, but uh, if you're a military member and you're interested in playing an AFI, the Armed Forces To Be Funny Ensemble, uh, our first rehearsal was yesterday evening, so we missed you. And uh, the next is this evening at, uh, let me make sure I get this correct, uh, 6 to 7 this evening for our AFI rehearsal. And also uh, tomorrow's rehearsal will be at 3 to 4.30 and then the performance will be Saturday at three. So any uh, military members that are interested in playing an AFI, uh, come join us this evening at uh, six o'clock. Uh, also, just a couple of reminders about uh, some of the social things that we're doing this evening, uh, and for to uh, actually, not this evening, tomorrow evening and on Saturday. So the bowling night uh, is on uh, tomorrow after the orchestra concert. So uh, go ahead and get the bowling gloves, right? You have bowling gloves? No? Uh, either way, get the bowling ball ready, get the shoes, and uh, dust them off. Uh, and we're going to have some lanes reserved. Won't be like a formal uh, thing, but it'll just be like we'll have several lanes enough for everyone to be able to play. And if it all goes well, we'll make it part of the uh, agenda for next year for sure. Uh, and also, um, Saturday after the grand concert, uh, where the exhibits are. So when you go in and you try your tubas and your flames and mouthpieces and such, that will be the place where we actually have our reception. Uh, so make sure after the concert on Saturday to join us there. Um, that is all I have for announcements. Uh, without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Rader, please. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
standard piece. Uh, I think it's one of the, uh, it's not a tuba piece, it's originally written for cello. I think it's one of the most beautiful pieces of music um, I've ever play, had a chance to play. This is the uh, Shostakovich Adagio from Limpid Stream.
It hasn't been around that long. This is uh, Five Muses by John Stevens. Uh, we're only going to play the first two movements, the song and dance. This was a piece that was um, brought about by a consortium. Uh, Aaron Hines uh, actually was the lead on the consortium and uh, pro 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 approached me about the project. And we started working together on it. And so he, he wanted me to be co-lead. Um, he did the world premiere of it in uh, March of last year. And then I had the opportunity, I played it at iTech this past summer in Knoxville. Uh, it's a wonderful piece. It's actually John's first major piece for tuba and piano, believe it or not. Um, it's a wonderful piece. It's about 20 minutes long, the entire piece. It's in five movements. But the nice thing is it can be broken up into smaller sections. Um, and so we're going to do the, just the first two. This is Song and Dance by John Stevens from Five Muses.
with John, um, I had an opportunity, uh, John Ailey premiered, did this awesome year, and he actually premiered the piece at the National Trumpet Competition that year, and uh, we, he did a performance there for the, for the school before he went out, and um, the second movement, I heard the second movement, it just spoke to me, it's be it's beautiful, and so I just turned to John, I'm like, John, I gotta play this, and so here it is, this is the second movement from the uh, John Stevens Trumpet Sonata. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
One more piece we'd like to play for you. Uh, this is a, a standard piece. Most people know this is the L.O.B. Tuba Concerto. Before we do, uh, I'd like to thank, thank Carol Conger for being such a great musician. It's been a pleasure to play with her today. I'd like to, again, thank the Army Band and the Army Band Tribute Phony and the section for hosting this conference, inviting them out. I'd also like to thank Minor Weston for uh, helping support the travel for this conference and for making such great instruments uh, as the one that I'm playing today. So thank you again for coming out, and this is the L.O.B. Tuba Concerto.
All right, we're live here. Good morning. Welcome to the mass reading session. Um, thanks everyone for coming out this morning. Um, just a few announcements I'd like to make. Um, some things going on through the day. Um, tonight we have, uh, wait, this is tomorrow. There's a bowling night. It's, uh, it's gonna happen after the orchestra concert. We would love to see everyone there. Uh, even if you don't like to bowl, feel free to come out and just hang with the, the guest artist and just get to know your fellow Tubi Phonium brothers and sisters. Um, there's also going to be a reception after the grand concert on Saturday, and that's gonna be in the community center, the building closest to us. Uh, so we'd love to see you there as well. Um, I think there's gonna be a cash bar if that interests any tuba players here, which I'm sure it does. So, <laughs> you Phonium players alike, so. Also, uh, this year we've revamped the AFTI, which is just an acronym for Armed Forces Tuba Euphonium Ensemble. So any active military um, or reserve or National Guard, guardist, you're welcome to come play in the ensemble. Um, and we have two rehearsals for that. There's one today at uh, six o'clock, six to seven. And there's one tomorrow from three to 4.30. I believe those are both gonna be in Laboda studio. So uh, please come out to that. And the concert will be on Saturday at 3 o'clock. All right, so uh, feel free to maybe blow a few notes, and then we'll get kicked off here with, with Gil. Thanks again for coming this morning.
Number four, please. Number four. to the fire. Thank you. 
right, here we go, number 14. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Number 60, please. Thank you. <coughs> Number 60.
Washington Grays, number two. Thank you. 
do another marching song. Let's do number 45. Army of the Mound. <laughs> Tempo. Here we go. Right into it. Those eight notes. <laughs> it's a thing that you sit on and you know, kind of <laughs> I don't know, I might break the one that I get on there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe rock it there, you go. All right. Coming on four. Uh uh uh. <laughs>
Number six. Sorry? 
second movement of this piece. Second movement, yes, I'm sorry. Second movement of the piece. <laughs> second movement of number six. Sorry about that. Confusing enough? No, no. The, the third part of number six says two, three, three by me. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. We're doing music. <laughs> Here we go. Two, uh, and. <laughs>
Diaz goes back to the I screwed her up again, didn't I? <laughs> My bad. <laughs> That's weird. I, I have here that it goes back to, to the beginning. Yeah, at the D it goes back to the beginning and we go all the way through to the end at, at, at the B. Well, we have an R and the GS all changed. Yep, it's supposed to go back to the beginning. No, Dave? What's that? Well, that's it. Wow, it's not marked that way in my part. Oh, well. Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's go to the marks, please. Let's go to the marks. Okay. Need to go to it. That's No, thank you. So when we do the when we do the DS, no repeats. Here's your tempo. Good luck. Ah, that sounds good. We'll do one, two, one. Thank you. 
Number 19, please. Number 19. Quite slow, so we start off with a subdivided three today. Take us two time to get there. <coughs> yes, sir. So be aware that there might be two cycles in the book. Be aware that what now? There's at least a two or three cycles. Yes, there's, there's three tuba parts, three youth, youth parts. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, who's got youth one? Raise your hand who's got youth one. Raise your hand who's got youth two. Wow, not that many. All right, youth three. Okay. Tuba one. Tuba one. Tuba two. Tuba three. Okay. Okay, it'll work itself out. Can't do anything about it anyway, right? Enjoy. Here we go. Again, subdivided by subdivided three. It's very slow. Then.
Request. Request time. Down on the number. Ah, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> Those of you who know me, we'll get to that. Liberty Bell March with this number. 29. 29, 29 please. <coughs> You all ready for this? Here we go. Here we 
There's a tempo. 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 Tempo.
shirt there, Jim. Okay, what else? What's that? 43. 
two more.
I'd like to take a march. All right, normally what we usually do is Emperor Inaroka, but it's okay, we could do something else. So, you want to do Emperor Inaroka or you want me to take another march? Yeah. Raise your hand if you want to do Emperor Inaroka. Okay, everybody strap yourselves in. Ready for this? Number three. Number three. Thank you, sir and ma'am. <laughs> Three. Folks, thank you very much for the opportunity. I want to thank the Army Band for, uh, for asking me to do this. And, you know, if you see someone in uniform, thank them, for, uh, first of all, for their service. And those of you, particularly with the, the Army guys, it's hard to tell the Army from the Air Force because they're all wearing green, right? But regardless, thank you for, for hosting this conference. They've been doing this conference for a long time. It's, it's really a terrific thing that they're doing. Great service to the community. Great opportunity for us, Tuba and Euphonium players, right? That we get to get together and, you know, and, and, and socialize and, and do all that stuff. And it's, it's just really a great thing. And I, I, you know, I came here in 1985 and was very green around the years. And, and these guys in the Army, they, you know, they, they kind of took me in, so to speak. And so I'm, you know, I'm forever great, grateful for the opportunities and all that. So you see these folks, make sure you thank them. Don't, don't, you know, go up to them and say thanks. I can't say that enough because it's, it's really, really terrific what they're doing. All right, Emperor Roca. Here's your tempo. And that's actually Tang, the friend that was speaking, for those of you who know. I guess I'm getting older. Slow down. Here we go. Uh, two, uh, 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 and. <laughs>
is going to be a bowling night where hopefully we get <laughs> some people to come and collaborate with the artist and it's going to be a great time to hang with your tuba and euphonium brethren. So come join some social hour after the concert tomorrow at the bowling alley. Um, the reception, there's going to be another reception after the grand concert on Saturday. That one's going to be in the community center, which is the building nearest to us. You, you can't miss it. Just head the opposite direction of the Russian Hall. Also, if there are any uh, active military duty, whether you're um, active or reservist or National Guardist, we have the AFTI. We've revamped AFTI. AFTI is American, I mean, Armed Forces to be Funny Ensemble. Um, there are two rehearsals for that. Today at 6 to 7 and tomorrow from 3 to 4.30 with a performance on Saturday at 3. So even if you're not playing in it, we'd love for you to come and hear that ensemble. Okay, so our guest speaker is currently studying his BMA at Michigan State and is also teaching at the University of Windsor. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to our greatest Falcone enthusiast, Travis Scott. on the life and work of Raymond Falcone. I'd like to start by expressing my sincere thanks to my friends at the U.S. Army Band for the Euphonium Workshop for giving me the opportunity to present this music. It's been great to see among so many of my heroes, so many friends here. In fact, it's almost like a USB Euphonium reunion. <laughs> <laughs> I am indebted to Sarah Roberts, the acquisitions archivist at MSU, to my friend Tom Gillette, a former student of Dr. Falcone's, and the director of the Meridian Community Band in East Lansing for helping edit and revise this presentation in addition to supplying a wealth of information on Dr. Falcone. Also Dr. Falcone's daughter, Cecilia Falcone, for her support in this project. And finally, Rita Comstock, for the, the author of Solid Brass, The Leonard Falcone Story, all of whom helped prepare this presentation today. To start, I'd like to give this presentation some direct direction by listing my objectives. And following this, we will travel chronologically through Falcone's life and times with plenty of visual highlights from his career. Finally, we will look at the legacy of Leonard Falcone, where his name and life's work lives on. Let's begin. I wanted to make this, uh, to take a moment to discuss the impetus for this project. When I first arrived at Michigan State, I taught a music course in low brass methods as part of my assistantship. And in this class each week, I would kind of spend five minutes talking about some of the movers and shakers of the tuba euphonium community. And as most of these students, music education students, uh, low brass was not their main instrument, um, they didn't know many of these musicians. However, when I got to Leonard Falcone, they kind of all sat up in their chairs, perked up a little bit. It was an 8 a.m. class, so they kind of woke up a little bit more. And they actually told me some information about Falcone that I didn't know about. So it was at that time that I realized that East Lansing is still very much Falcone's town 30 years after his death. So my objectives for this are as follows. To present a visually impacting chronological presentation of the Leonard Falcone archives. To capture the multifaceted impact that Falcone had as a soloist, as a band director, and as a music educator to discuss his de developmental years as he became a prominent baritone horn soloist and a nationally known band director, and to present his legacy as a narrative of his life and series of accomplishments in the fields of instrumental education and applied teaching. Falcone came to the, came to the United States carrying a bell trombone in 1915. He had learned to play brass instruments as a member of his hometown band uh, in Rosetto Valpatore. By all accounts, this band was remarkable. And much later in his life, Falcone would remark about the director, Donato Antonio Donatelli, and say that he was very methodical and went note by note. Every note had to be correct. 
and it was a very thorough training and no distractions were allowed. Rehearsals were tedious, meticulous, and slow, but the results were absolutely perfect in technique, expression, and style. According to his former students, the influence of this early mentor would guide Falcone for the rest of his life. In 1917, a new citizen of the US, Falcone won a violin in a street fair and began to teach himself to play. Eventually, he would begin taking lessons with local musicians who would encourage him to begin studying at the University of Michigan School of Music in Ann Arbor. And of course, here's a picture of him holding a violin. You probably were not expecting that. <coughs> uh, here's a program where Falcone is performing on a student's recital dated February 2nd, 1921. 96 years ago to the day. It must have been one of his very first solo performances on the violin. Uh, this concert from the Supervisor's Orchestra of the University School of Music from June of 1927 was a mere, weeks, uh, a mere few weeks before Falcone would be named the music director of Michigan State University. Note that the uh, director, Joe Maddy, um, was the man who would go on to form and found Interlochen. This feature also, uh, this concert also featured Nicholas Falcone, his brother, performing the Weber con uh, concertino for clarinet, and Leonard was conducting Grieg's The Last Spring. Like his brother Nicholas, Leonard gigged around Ann Arbor and Detroit. Eventually, both became directors of very popular silent movie theaters um, of the orchestras. This role gave both brothers amazing publicity as their names were often printed in advertisements and on ticket stubs. In 1923, Leonard was named director of the popular 1900-seat Majestic Theater in Ann Arbor, and this put him on the spotlight for the uh, Central Michigan community. Here's a picture of the theater at near capacity. In August of 1927, Falcone was named as the band director of what was then called Michigan State College Agriculture and Applied Science. This is an article from the Lansing State Journal, published on September 16, 1927, announcing new hires in the music building. Its opening line states that music will be made a significant part of the college. Let me tell you just a few, uh, little bit about the people. Um, on the far left was American composer Arthur Farwell. Uh, he, used, he was a composer who incorporated a lot of Native American folk songs. Oops. Where are we at? There we go. That's why they call this live, right? Um, so Arthur F Farwell on the far left um, was an American composer who used a lot of Native American folk music in his compositions and who developed his own lithograph music printing company after having dif difficulties finding a publisher for his works. And then we have Falcone, Hope Hallway, the first professor of music education, and finally Lewis Richards, head of the music department. Richards, along with Falcone, would come to make great advancements in the music program at Michigan State. And just as a, a side story, uh, Richards toured U Europe as a concert pianist until the outbreak of the First World War. And in 1914, Herbert Hoover led relief efforts in Belgium, and Richards served as one of his principal aides, eventually organizing the distribution of clothing and foodstuffs in Brussels and northern France. His relationship with Hoover would benefit MSU and its band in coming years, as we will soon get to. At the same time, Leonard's brother Nicholas was heading up the band at the University of Michigan. This was a very well-known and highly publicized fact among students and within the communities because the Falcone brothers were already well-known and associated with each other through their work in the movie theaters. Tragically, uh, in 1934, Nicholas would re resign due to a complete loss of hearing. Here are two pictures, uh, two of the clearer pictures from this era of Nicholas and Falcone around 1928. And then here are the two 50 years later at an award ceremony at the University of Michigan for Nicholas. It is surmised that one of Leonard's first solo appearances on the euphonium was at the Interlochen summer camp where he was leading violin sectionals, conducting bands, and also soloing. Here are two pictures of him doing so at Interlochen, uh, and I 
would point out the difference of equipment. We have an upright bell and the, the signature bell front horn that he was playing on. And Byron Hansen, if you look uh, on the picture on your right over Falcone's right shoulder, um, Byron Hansen surmises that the, those two gentlemen were A. Austin Harding and Joe Maddy. A little photo bomb there from 1927. In 1930, the National High School Band Contest was held in Flint, Michigan. No problems were reported with the water. And <laughs> thank you. And according to the Journal of Band Research, 44 bands participated. The event went well into the evening, and at midnight, the final event of the night was given, a performance by the hosting Flint Band, featuring guest solo Leonard Falcone. All of the other bands were in the auditorium listening to the concert, awaiting the results of the competition. And according to this article, Falcone gave one of his signature electrifying performances. And I quote, the judges roused themselves from a long sleep when Mr. Falcone began to play, according to all accounts. Those judges including, included A. Austin Harding, the famous director of bands at the University of Illinois, Captain Taylor Bronson, then director of the US Marine Band, Edwin Franco Goldman, and John Philip Sousa. This performance would win Falcone performance invitations from the Goldman Band and also uh, A. Austin Harding's band. It also was the start of a long-lasting relationship with each of these judges. On October 31st, 1930, Michigan State College football team played against Georgetown in DC. And while there, the band performed the Star Spangled Banner at the wreath-laying ceremony, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Later in the morning, the band traveled to the White House, where they were received by President Herbert Hoover. Here is a picture of Falcone conducting the band for President Hoover on the South Lawn and a pose with the entire band. Uh, Falcone is in the left, left of Hoover Center on the path there. Later that afternoon, the band poses for a picture on the steps of the Capitol building. Don't mess with that baton. You will not miss a downbeat with that baton. Also in 1930, Falcone introduced on the campus of Michigan State um, a tradition from his hometown band, the uh, open air concerts. Uh, here's a very, very early program from that time period. And these would grow to enormous popularity, eventually attracting crowds exceeding 3,000 people. Because of the sustaining popularity, the class of 1937 initiated the construction of a band shell that was dedicated in 1938 at this performance. And here's a picture of the band shell. It was designed at Falcone's request after the Chicago's, uh, Chicago's Jackson Park shell, and eventually, sadly, the band shell would be torn down. It's no longer a feature on the campus at Michigan State. In 1939, the world found itself in the Second Great War. After the US became involved, uh, Falcone temporarily resigned from Michigan State and enlisted. He served from September 23rd, 1942 to June 2nd, 1943. After the war, he found that the universities were gutted with many of the students that made up his bands serving. In this 1946 article, he states that he only had 30 people returning for the marching band that fall. Quoting Falcone, we're the worst off in the noise section. We have no baritone players on hand and need at least four. <laughs> Three years later, however, in 1949, Falcone was boasting a marching band composed of 100 players. It appeared all was back on course and set for a rebirth that would flourish to greater heights than ever before. Echoing the rest of the United States society, the 50s were a tremendously successful decade for Falcone's band program. He directed his bands in extensive tours throughout the Midwest, and the marching band, which of course he also directed, performed at the Rose Bowl, um, and parades putting it on the national spotlight. And finally, the concert band made several highly praised performances at major national conventions. Also, the university was expanding rapidly, and in 1955, the state, of the, uh, the state made a college a university, finally changing the name to Michigan State University in 1964. 
On January 17, 1953, the university celebrated Falcone's 25th year as service as the director of bands. This banquet was a huge undertaking with nearly 800 invitations sent out uh, to alumni, band directors, and friends, and even more throughout the country. Uh, unfortunately, even though 250 had replied that they were coming, there was a, apparently a, t a terrible snowstorm that night, and the attendees were uh, still, we had about 150 there. Uh, these well wishes came in from all over the, uh, the nation. I mean, just here are a few highlights. This is uh, the president of the university, John Hanna, the mayor of Lansing, the mayor of East Lansing, Ray Dvorak, who was the director of bands at the University of Wisconsin and very active in the American Bandmasters Association. J.J. Richards, the famous March composer. Edwin Franco Goldman, founder of the renowned Goldman Band, um, and also the founder of American, the American Bandmasters Association. I just love his signature. Also, uh, George Landers, a very influential Iowan band director. John Ayuli, a trumpet alumni who performed with the Mets, the New York Philharmonic, the Detroit Symphony, and eventually the Atlantic Symphony. Merle Evans, who's associated with the Ringling Brothers uh, Circus Band, directing it for 50 years. Glenn Cliff Bainham, the first uh, director of bands at Northwestern University. And my personal favorite, Carl King, who wrote, Baritone Players Are Indestructible. So in 1956, Michigan State traveled to Pasadena, California with the football team, and Falcone orchestrated an uh, intense national tour. This 12-day tour, sponsored entirely by Oldsmobile, had performances in Denver, Las Vegas, Pasadena, Tucson, Dallas, St. Louis, and also <coughs> included performances on the Bob Crosby Show in Los Angeles, a TV, broadcast, uh, a TV show broadcast around the nation to about 150 stations. This gave the MSU music program and Falcone national recognition overnight. Looking through the personnel list, we can find several names of interest. One is Byron Autry, who would eventually become the uh, instructor of trumpet at Michigan State. And also a note, especially to this community, uh, is someone in the baritone section, Earl Lauder. Nineteen sixty seven, the fourteenth national biennial conference of the College Band Directors National Association, which was held in Ann Arbor. This was one of Falcone's two perfect performances, concerts in which he claimed he was completely satisfied, the other being in nineteen fifty eight on the same stage. And here's the program from that concert. Of particular note to me um, is the repertoire. We might find it easy to associate Falcone with kind of a traditional classic repertoire if we were to gauge that off of his solo recordings. But here we see premieres, new works written for band, and that does point to his interest in new repertoire for the concert band and his key role in developing the concert band movement in the United States. Once again, looking at the program, we find a few familiar names. Leading the tuba section is Marty Erickson. And finally, here's a picture of the band taken on the stage of um, Hill Auditorium in Ann Arbor. Excuse me. On April 17, 1966, Falcone wrote a letter to the director of the music department, which read, on April 5, 1967, I will have reached the age of 68. And by, Ju by July 1, 1967, I will have served the university for 40 years. In consideration of these factors, it seems to be the proper time to retire. Falcone would go out with a bang and his, with his performances in Ann Arbor, and he must have left with a tremendous feeling of great accomplishment. The university quickly named Harry Bijan as his successor. Though he retired as the director of bands, Falcone continued on teaching applied lessons. The 1970s were a decade of prosperity for the euphoniums at MSU, and here are a few examples. This is a 1977 concert of the MSU Symphony Band. Oops. Uh, 
gets it. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a 1977 concert of the MSU Symphony Band under the direction of Kenneth Bloomquist with guest conductors Leonard Falcone and Jerry Billick. Falcone conducted the band in the Barat Andante and Allegro featuring the entire baritone section playing in unison. Uh, also, he conducted Stars and Stripes and the Verdi Sicilian Vespers. Uh, featured in, this, in the section were Michael Schott, Mike Fisher, Tom Gillette, all active euphonium players in Michigan's brass bands, and also Roger Behrend. This 1970 Low Brass Studio concert features tubas Eugene Dowling uh, of Vancouver and James Kernaw on euphonium. A former solo euphonium with the uh, U.S. Army Field Band, Robert Jorgensen, went to Michigan State to study with Falcone and Bloomquist upon uh, leaving the field band and holding similar posts as uh, band director at Midwestern State in Texas and also Moorhead State University. Here's a, here's a recital from his degree um, uh, concert in 1974 where he was accompanied by his wife Anne and also this included his brother Richard Jorgensen who taught trumpet for 34 years at Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. Bob, Bob would go on to be the director of the University of Akron where he was my band director for my undergrad and sadly he passed away uh, two fourth of July's ago, doing something he loved, conducting on a concert. Finally, we have Roger Barron's junior recital. And you might pay also note to the accompanist, David Gillingham. Falcone, the man, was revered by his colleagues and students alike. He was respected as an authority in music but was admired for his kind, understanding, and modest soul. I wanted to play this speech from 1984 that took place in East Lansing one month after he was inducted into the National Band Association's Hall of Fame of Distinguished Band Conductors. After a warm introduction by Kenneth Bloomquist, Falcone is welcomed in his hometown where he gives this warm speech, highlighting some of the more endearing qualities of his personality.
the cooperation I've received from the members of this very fine band. I've enjoyed working with them very, very much. I want them to know <laughs> how much I appreciate their, their cooperation. And last but not least, I would like to say that I will be forever grateful to the uh, officials and the members of the Michigan State University Alumni Band, which initiated my candidacy for the Hall of Fame, and they pursued it to the end, to my election. <coughs> I want to thank you so much, and I will never forget what you've done for me. Also, I appreciate you people who come to this concert and be with us tonight. So thank you very much to everyone. On May 2nd, 1985, Leonard Falcone passed away in a care facility in Diamonddale, Michigan, a small town southwest of Lansing, and the torch was finally passed. All who were influenced by this man have ensured that his legacy continues for what is one of the most beautiful tributes a person could ever ask for. In September of 2014, this memorial plaque was placed outside of the Falcone office uh, during his tenure as a band director. Its inscription reads, his legacy lives on today in the form of the legions of loyal students who have gone on, who have gone to teach and play throughout the world. Falcone was also associated with the Blue Lakes Fine Arts Camp from 1964 to 1984. He directed the camp's first international band tour in 1971 which made a stop in his hometown in Italy. He also donated most of his time at Blue Lake, refusing salary. As a result of his association and leadership with the camp, they built the Leonard Falcone Band Pavilion on the campus of Blue Lake Fine Arts Camp. Of course, one of the main initiatives to carry on his tradition was the annual competition in Blue Lakes, which has been the launching pad for the careers of many of our profession's leaders of today and some of the future leaders who we're going to hear in about 30 minutes or so. Finally, I would like to point out two, researches, uh, two resources rather, uh, for those of you interested in more information. Again, Rita Comstock's 2011 text, Solid Brass, The Leonard Falcone Story. It's a very entertaining read and thorough, um, uh, thorough, thorough book as well. And also, I, uh, as I was going through these archives, I came across an unknown arrangement, at least to me, of the Adagio Cantabile by Tar uh, Tartini. And I came to find this has somewhat of an interesting lineage. It was discovered in a uh, box of archives at the old tuba euphonium press by Gail Robertson, who gave it to Beryl, and she put it in the archives, and then I found it. Um, so we've, we've actually published it. It's being used this, this summer, the Student Falcone competition. And also, I want to point out that Brian Doughty at Cimarron Music uh, volunteered to donate all of the proceeds to the Falcone competition of this, of this. And I have a few available if you would like to purchase one. In closing, I would like to read an excerpt from a letter written in 1977 by Bill Moffat, an innovator in the concert and marching band world, who was also a brief time an assistant at the Michigan State University from 1960 to 1969. He wrote this letter in support of Falcone's honorary doctorate, which was awarded in 1978. And here he writes, Leonard Falcone 
is one of those rare human beings who dedicates his life to others and who serves as a living example of what each of us hopes to accomplish in our own lifetime. First of all, he is a great human being with compassion for others, with a love of beauty in life as well as in music, with the ability to inspire others to achieve at their capacity, with leadership in the profession that is known and respected throughout the world, and with the physical and mental energy to maintain his contribution to the university and to music at a rate that would exhaust most of his colleagues. He is a giant amongst men, he is a giant among musicians, and he is a giant among teachers. And with that, I once again want to express my sincere thanks to the US Army Band for hosting, uh, for allowing me to present this. It's such a true honor to be here, and I thank you for your time. Thank you.
Um, exhibits will be opening Friday at noon to 5.30 and Saturday from 9 to 5.30. Uh, bowling night will be Friday night after the orchestra concert, right down the street at the bowling alley. Should be lots of fun. We have lanes reserved, so come and bring your bowling shoes, or you can rent them there. Um, let's see. Reception after the grand concert on Saturday is in the community center, also down the street. Um, come and meet the guest artists and have conversations and have a great time. And any uh, military personnel, we are bringing back the Armed Forces Tuba Euphonium Ensemble. Rehearsals for that will be today at 6 o'clock, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, and the performance will be Saturday at 3 o'clock. So um, this is the Leonard Falcone winner's recital, where we have the winner of the Euphonium Artist Division and the Tuba Artist Division. Uh, we've been doing this recital for seven years. I had to count it several times backstage to, to realize that it's actually been seven years of doing this. So. Um, I hope you appreciate it. It's uh, lots of Falcone winners end up in this building working here. So uh, we really appreciate the competition and what it stands for. Um, the first performer will be the Euphonium winner, uh, Joe Broom. He is currently an undergraduate Euphonium performance major at the University of Michigan. So welcome, Joe. Thank <laughs> you. 
just heard was Alan Vizzuti's Cascades, a wonderful piece, required repertoire for last year's Falcone competition. And as you hear, I'm, I, I think it works beautifully on euphonium. And yeah, terrific way to start. So to move things along, uh, the next piece I'm playing is written by a friend, a mentor. Uh, his name is David Banman, and he writes these really wonderful pieces. Uh, I think all of you actually know him, but <laughs> uh, this piece in particular uh, is wonderful because what he mixes is sort of classical tradition with Latin jazz. So it's this really cohesive, interesting, uh, uh, structured piece. And it lends itself very well to a performance in venues such as this. So Without further delay, La Carita de Toros by David Banman. Thank 
So to change the program a little bit more, uh, next we will be playing the first movement from Hummel's Bassoon Concerto. Um, and then we hope to finish off, finish off with uh, the first movement of Vladimir Cosma's Euphonium Concerto. So, you know, a couple concerti to sort of finish this out, uh, at least my half. I want to thank so many people. I want to thank my parents first for supporting my career all this way and for their continuing support. Uh, I want to thank the Falcone Festival uh, for being such a wonderful oasis of euphonium talent, euphonium and tuba talent, and for uh, you know par partnering with the U.S. Army Tuba Euphonium Workshop to make this op opportunity possible. So I'm really grateful. And uh, yes, let's just go. <laughs> First movement, Hummel's Bassoon Concerto.
Okay, next up we have our Tuba Falcone winner. Um, Preston Light is a doctoral student at Cincinnati. Welcome, Preston.
Mm-hmm. 
by Greg Danner. Um, Dr. Danner is the professor of theory and composition at Tennessee Tech where I did my undergraduate. I was a student for four years and I had no idea he had ever written this piece and I stumbled upon it when I was trying to find something new and he sent it to me and said it's not been premiered or not been played that often and uh, it's a set it's the first of a series of rhapsodies that he's tried to write for all wind instruments. So Rhapsody by Greg Dan.
Mm-hmm.
doing, um, I found out about through uh, David Zirkel from the University of Georgia. Um, Eric Alexander is a composer and trombonist in the Atlanta area. Um, these are just really fun. There's five in all. I'm only doing three today, but they're dances set in different styles. And since Carol Conger here is actually taking on a different role, she's going to be a percussionist <laughs> for me today. <laughs> so to whoever's watching that this matters, I think she gets doubler's pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. 
So I wanted to make sure that I, I got, got um, some housekeeping things out of the way, a couple of announcements. I know you're probably hearing these every time, but I, we want to make sure everyone hears it, um, that the exhibits will be open tomorrow at noon to 5.30, and then on Saturday from 9 o'clock to 5.30. It should be in your program, but we want to make sure we reiterate that. Go check that out at the community center uh, starting tomorrow around lunchtime. And that tomorrow night after the orchestra concert, we are going to attempt to have a first annual bowling night uh, for the workshop. So we're hoping that folks uh, head down to the bowling alley after the orchestra concert and uh, have a good time getting to know each other. Uh, outside of uh, uh, tuba euphonium performance aspect, we can just get to know each other. Um, and then uh, another opportunity for that is the reception after the grand concert on uh, Saturday. So that'll be at the community center, which is just short of uh, the bowling alley. And it'll be in the same room that you're going to enjoy all of your exhibits in. And uh, last, but for our uh, military folks, AFT rehearsal is this afternoon at 6 o'clock or 1800 in military language, uh, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and then tomorrow from 3 o'clock to 4.30. All right, let's get on with the show. Our next artist is a world-renowned tubist. Um, he's held posts in orchestras in seven different countries, including <laughs> Sweden, uh, Iceland, and... Um, uh, Singapore nailed it, and Mexico. Uh, so I added a fourth one. Uh, but currently, he is in the he is the uh, principal tubist with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, and uh, we are very excited to have him. Be sure to check him out tomorrow evening on the orchestra concert. Uh, please help me welcome Tim Busby.
Thank you very much. I was told to use this mic, so I will. <laughs> Paybacks, huh? Anyways, uh, that first piece, uh, as you can see in your program, I've changed up the program a bit. That first piece was called Hammer It. Um, I found that piece on some travels that I did a, f all a year or so back, and I found it in my pile of music that I'm constantly going through to try to get through all of it. And I thought, oh, that'd be cool. That's that looks like a cool piece, and I think it was originally written for a contrabass trombone, and uh, but it's much better on the tuba, so uh, <laughs> that's why I wanted to show you. So uh, next piece on the program is a piece called The Impossible Love, which is uh, the second movement of a larger piece that was written for me. I'm, I did the premiere here with the, the band in 2011. Um, Federin wrote this piece for me, and I really like the second movement just because of the name, and all, it's, it's beautiful also, but... The name is pretty cool, The Impossible Love, and, and as I say, you know, especially as a, as a tuba player, we're struggling quite often to be loved. Uh, so this is my answer to that, so please love me. But before you love me, <laughs> please help me welcome my partner in crime for the next two pieces, um, Carol.
Gorgeous piece. If you don't think so, you're not human. Anyways. Uh, next piece, um, two movements from Prokofiev, Romeo and Juliet. Probably don't really need to say much more than that. You'll like it. Again, originally written for something a bit uh, larger, but um, still uh, debatable whether better on tuba. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, that's great. And uh, again, a lot to ask for on the piano, and, and Carol's always up for the, the task. So please, uh, another warm thank you. <laughs> so, sorry. So, since I'm changing the program on you, the next piece is going to be a piece called The Wasteland by your own Neil Corwell, who was a member of the band for many years. Uh, Neil wrote this, I'm not exactly sure when Neil wrote this, to be honest with you, but he wrote it, and it's based on the poem of the same name. And it's a rather dark piece, but I like it, and um, I think the boys like playing it with me also. Um, this is The Wasteland by Neil Corwell, and I'll get a few extra players up here with me to uh, perform this. If what you probably already know is Neil is a, a, a very, very good composer, and, and I would uh, recommend you guys uh, look for as much of his music as possible. You know, uh, tuba players and euphonium players and even other low brass instruments. Hey, guys, you have a good time? Good. Uh, anyways, uh, other low brass instruments. We need to absolutely beg these good composers to keep writing for us. Um, there is not a lot of good music for us, I'm sorry to say. So anytime you get a chance to grab one of your composer friends and have them write something, please do it. And then once they're doing it, treat them nice so they'll keep doing it, okay? Because we need all the help we can get. So here we go. If you guys are ready, do I have to introduce you one by one? Thing? Here they are. Give them, give them a big applause.
Okay. Yeah, they're great. Um, so next piece, final piece in the program, uh, and then I'm going to just talk to you guys for maybe uh, uh, 20 or so minutes about a few things that's been on my mind, and uh, then we'll go from there. And, and if you uh, still want to hear one more short little piece after my whole spiel, then uh, me and Matt will play a little duet for you. Man, th this is actually a pain talking in this thing. But... Anyways, uh, next piece, a piece called Tuba for Saga. I wrote this in, I don't remember, two, 2008 or so, 2009. Um, my wife is Swedish, and uh, several times we go to Sweden during Midsummer Festival, which is, if you don't know much about Swedish culture or Scandinavian culture, uh, basically it's just a reason for them to get hammered on schnapps and eat rotten fish. But it's a good time, and by the end of it, they're dancing around this little pole singing these weird songs. 
and uh, it gets pretty pretty scary at times. But um, it's a fun time, and during this time, I had this little tune in my head, and I finally I wrote it down, and something so pretty actually got quite scary sounding. And anyways, wherever I go in the world, and I play this tuba for Saga, or even if I don't play it, um, people always ask me, did, well, did, did tuba for win? And... Uh, I say, well, you know, it says in the story, you, you decide. I don't know. It depends on how you feel. Don't ask me. But I kept thinking about this, and I thought, well, I'll tell you, I'm going to write two more movements of this and, uh, you know, f finish the story. My first idea was I was going to write an opera, but um, I thought, I don't know, maybe that's a little bit stretching it. But I wrote two more movements. Uh, the second one is basically about, um, especially in today's day, these times that we're living in now, um, Quite often, I come across people that um, have been beat down by life so much that sometimes you you feel and they feel that maybe it's easier just to stay down instead of keep trying to fight. And for me, that breaks my heart to see uh, these these things going on in, in the world today. And so the second movement is actually based on that. And it's it's um, basically Tubifer has been beat down by the two dark angels, and he's in a, a fairy tan a fairy tale world. And uh, he's almost basically decided to just give up. It's better to stay down and just keep fighting. And, and his Savior, I actually wrote the Savior part for my, my wife, who was much better looking than Matt Van Emmerich. But, uh, <laughs> but Matt will have to do since I've shared a bed with him for the last two nights. So, uh, <laughs> not the first time. Not the first time, probably not the last. But anywho, um, so Matt's my Savior, and you'll hear Matt play this beautiful uh, melody trying to tell me basically this is... This is not who you are. Get up and keep fighting, and that's what we all have to do in life. We, no matter how bad it gets, you just have to get your butt up and keep keep getting after it. So, uh, and then the third movement is that fight. That's when Tubifer finally has had enough, and he he goes um, crazy. Clean word uh, on the two dark angels. Now, I'm sorry to say, but Tubifer actually loses, um, but in a way he wins because he lives long enough and he fights hard enough just to have one more love song with his with his true love so this is uh, tupa for saga Chris just reminded all of us on stage, you know, just remember, don't laugh. Um, and it brought back a little a story. In Sydney, Australia, uh, me and Roland and a student of, of mine were doing just the first movement of this, and we didn't rehearse at all. <coughs> and so Roland, me and Roland are standing out right before they, Roland Stapali, I'm sure you guys all know him, he's incredible. But um, not not just a tuba player, I'm talking about he's an incredible person. But um Plays super good too. But um, anyways, uh, we were standing out just before we walked on, and, and he was like, okay, so what what are you going to say? I said, I, l just listen for these words, you know, this, 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 and this, and then just play, watch me. He was like, oh, that's cool. Well, when we first did it, you'll hear the story. At one point, he didn't quite realize what was about to be said, and he just breaks out laughing. And then I got the giggles, and so we ended up sitting on stage for about five minutes laughing. Um, which is a little bit too long, like a little bit's cool and people will laugh with you, but once the audience dies out and you're still laughing, not a good look, okay? So we're going to try not to do that. tuba angel with a low rester so great most would bow at his feet. Tubifer enjoyed life to the fullest, drinking craft beer, smoking Cuban cigars, fine single malt scotches, and eating the best Texas barbecue in the world, which Believe it or not, actually can only be found in Texas. I saw your little restaurant down here. 
It says Texas barbecue. <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> Two of the ugliest ego craze Dark Angel have to get to them. Maestro, who's always give tuba for the hands, <laughs> and management, who is always trying to take money out of tuba for his pocket. They were out to drag him to the depths of pianissimo hell. <laughs> Maestro and management will try to trick Tuba for me by offering him a full buffet with free refills of beer. Free refills of beer! Tuba for knows this is way too good to be true, especially with the economy the way it is these days. Here we go. trick hasn't worked. An epic battle is about to begin. Will Tuba for win? You decide.
Live music, man. It's great, huh? So, um, yeah, perfect. So, I, uh, when I was originally asked to come and attend and be uh, one of the guest artists again this year, I thought about it quite a bit. And normally, normally, um, in my life, I like to... Uh, have something that I'm focused on every year. Um, sometimes it bleeds over to the next year and, and so on and so on, but I'm constantly picking something, uh, either a part of me that I want to work on or part of my playing or, or part of just my surroundings or where I live a lot of times. That's maybe why I've moved so much. But um, I'm constantly trying to um, focus on one particular thing and give all of my energy to that thing. Um, now, 
one of the the best parts of my job as a as a principal tuba in a in a really good and big um, orchestra is we get a lot of really good soloists that come through town every week. Uh, there's somebody different because they won't let me get up there too much. And uh, but I get to observe from the back of the stage these incredible pianists and these incredible violinists and cellos and on and on and on. And uh, one thing that I continue to notice is something that um, maybe most people just call stage presence or, um, yeah, presenting yourself on stage. Um, how good they are at doing that. What is it that makes them much better than me or much better than us as tuba players and little brass players? Um, so I started to think about it, and it's e even more so now that I've actually started thinking about it, and I, I watch my students at home uh, do their recitals and whatnot, and, and we were just at um, the, in Knoxville for the tuba conference, and I went to several of the recitals, and, you know, again, I, I'm looking at, I'm watching these concerts with a different mind frame now. I'm not really listening so much to what's coming out of the bell, but how they're presenting what's coming out of the bell. Because uh, it's just a, it's actually much smaller part than you believe, uh, actually, how you play. Um, it's not really about how you look, how tall you are, fat, skinny, whatever. There's a lot more to it than that, I feel. Um, and I think tuba players, and maybe I'm going to get crucified for saying these kind of things, but I think tuba players are actually quite bad at it. Uh, we're still maybe very behind uh, the eight ball when it comes to really presenting us and then we happen to be tuba players um, and I think that's the way to look at it um, it's not good enough anymore just to walk on stage sit down smile you know you of course you have to do all the the normal common sense things you got to dress decent you gotta look like you've brushed your hair in the last week or so if you have it um, you have to practice your bowels in front of the mirror and, and all that good stuff. I'm not saying that that's not important. That's very important also. Um, but I'm talking about the other, the other part of it, the, the, um, the thing that's going to set you apart from other people. Okay? Um, and what I realized when I started thinking about this and also applying it to myself is we all struggle with nerves. You know, nerves can absolutely destroy you on stage and... and you know, this kind of stuff I'm actually talking about can be uh, applied to any just day-to-day -day life stuff because as much as I love the tuba, it is not everything that I think about every day, believe me. Um, so, and I'm sure a lot of you are the same way. But uh, what I've noticed after I've kind of changed my mindset is that thinking more about what I'm talking about now instead of what you're doing and your preparation to, to, to get on stage to do what you're going to do actually helps with the nerves. Um, you know, I tell my students at home, the, fir the first rule is when you step on that stage, it's no longer about you. It's about the audience, you know. So stop worrying about yourself. Everything you do in the practice room, that's your time, you know. And uh, a, a great man once said, you know, never, never practice, always perform. And I understand that, that what he was getting at. But I think that in the practice room, you need to be nuts and bolts, break it down, dissect it, put it to its simplest form, and then build it back up from there. That is, you know, that's, that's a whole different topic. But once you get that fixed, and you walk out on this stage or any other stages you do, or walk up to that girl in the bar, gonna try to pick her up, or whatever you can apply this to, uh, things are changing, okay? so. It's no longer about you. Stop thinking about yourself. You're not doing it for your grade. You're not doing it because you have to, because it's my junior's you know, recital or all these other things. I want to see how, I, I mean, I hear all, also, you know, this is even auditions. I want to see how uh, I, I react in these situations. I'm gonna, this is a learning experience for me. I don't get that. I don't understand that. You know, you have to take the spotlight off of you and put it onto them. And what you'll start realizing is, you don't get so nervous because you're more you're more worried about them. How do they feel? Are they having a good time? Are they relaxed? Are they comfortable? Are they getting from me what I want them to get from me? These are all the things you need to start thinking about. Okay, um, turn that spotlight off yourself and and put it back on where it, where it belongs, and that's the audience. 
Um, figure out a way to transport them from where they're sitting to where you're at in your head. Okay? So whatever you're doing on stage, slow, beautiful, high, loud, angry, you know, all these things that we want, we need to be able to show, you need to make them feel the same way. Okay? Know what they want. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy once, once you do a lot of solo recitals and people ask you to come and, and play at their school or their whatever, lots of times you'll get these requests. Oh, hey, can you play six pack? Or hey, can you play tuba for saga? Or, you know, you get these little things. So you kind of know that people want to hear you play loud and low and these kind of things. But you also want to um, be one step ahead of the audience. So um, I can also play really soft. Most people don't know that about me. You know, so I know that that um, if I, th that you want it, especially after hearing me blow my brains out for an hour, that that little bit of relief of, of really, really soft playing is something that you actually are craving, you know. So to always be trying to think one step in front of the audience is is very important. Stop fidgeting on stage. Um, I love I love playing bolero and most tuba players go what but. Even though, it, even though it's probably the most, well, not, not, I shouldn't say, one of the top ten boring tuba parts ever written, what I love about it is sitting there and looking down the line of the principal trombone player because he or she is absolutely pooing their pants. <laughs> and you know this because they empty their spit valve about 18 or 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> There's the clarinet. Uh oh <laughs> It's like, buddy, there's nothing in there, man. Don't worry. <laughs> but just watching him or her, whoever's playing it, by the time that entrance does come, speed out or whatever happens, uh, you feel their nerves. You're, you're as nervous as they are because you're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Oh, thank God. You know, so, um, you know, and the same thing happens on stage. You know, we see it all the time. Somebody comes in and they adjust their stand like, you know, and then, no, that's not right, and then this and this, and there's squim, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but, um, you know, putting yourself out there and, and, and doing it and is, I think, the, one of the best ways, and, and also to have that, that different, different mind frame. Know that what you're bringing on stage is something special. It is, no matter who you are, okay? Maybe you can't play as high, as low, as fast, as soft, and blah, 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 all that stuff, then that recording that you're listening to at home that we all listen to and go, dang it, I'll never be able to play it like that, you know? But when you step on stage, you have to believe that what you're there to offer is special because we're all special, man. We're all special people. You're different than me, and I'm different than you. I cannot do what you do on stage because I am not you. I have not lived your life, okay? So find out what makes you special. Find out what makes you special and build your playing or your being from there, okay? Um, another thing, um, uh, let's see how I put this. I'm just gonna say it because that's just the way. Um, find your inner badass, okay? Um, it's the one that that you talk to in the mirror, you know. Come on, come on. Name him or her. Give him a name. Mine, mine has a name. He's Tim Busby. Come on, Tim, nail it. You know, look in yourself in the mirror and tell you, tell yourself that you're gonna rock. You, you are special. You are gonna tear this up. Okay. Positive, positive mindset. You. Girls and boys who mark all over your music constantly and mark all this negative stuff up. A, you know, I get some of my students will come in and they got a piece of music there and it says, you know, stuff like don't suck or, or, you know, this kind of stuff. And I, you know, I'm like, don't put that up there. T throw that you know, I away. None of that stuff can be there. I just don't understand going on stage for a concert or a recital and as soon as you flip the page, you see something negative. You cannot have that kind of stuff in your life. Um, we get enough of that stuff from uh, the, our surroundings telling us we're not good enough. We don't need to be telling ourselves that we're not good enough, okay? So cut all that out, find your inner badass, 
and then tell him or her good things, lots of good things. It may sound cheesy, but I'm telling you, it works. And then when you come on the stage, you have to own it. You have to just come on, do your job. Hopefully they have a good time and then get off. Okay? Um, and I feel that doing it that way with that mindset takes a lot of the focus off ourselves. And in turn, that gives us a little bit more confidence from the nerves. Because as I say before, you know, the... Uh, nerves, you know, lots of people take beta blockers and all these drugs to get rid of nerves. I also don't understand that. I, I like nerves. I think nerves are very useful. Some of the most amazing things in my life has happened when, when I was the most nervous. My first child, I was absolutely a wreck, you know, but what an incredible thing. If I would have drugged myself up so I wouldn't have been able to be nervous, I just can't believe that, you know. Your first kiss, man, I was, woo, scared, you know, and... But wow, amazing. Can you imagine being? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so, you know, don't take away nerves. Learn how to, learn how to use your nerves for your performance without letting your nerves get the best of you. Okay, that's, there's a lot of other tricks with that. But taking the focus off yourself, I think, is the number one thing. In, in Melbourne, I have my kids do push-ups and run around uh, the room and do jumping jacks um, and then make them play something really soft or, you know, like, all right, Mahler one, and they're like, dum, 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 and sweating, and, you know, short, short, you know, shorter breath and all this stuff. But that's a lot of the same symptoms we get when we are nervous. So if you can do it in those type of situations, you can do it anytime. So good. Um, let's see. I think I'm going to just play one more piece with Matt, and I'm going to call it a day. I've had a long two weeks now on the road, and uh, I'm tired. So here we go. We're going to play. Uh, Matt, come on. You know, this guy, this guy's awesome, and um, he actually lives, well, he would, he would correct me, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it the way you would say it. I actually live on his street in Melbourne, so we're actually neighbors, but my house that I'm building is overlooking his from a mountain, like looking down on him, so I'm going to keep an eye on him now, but uh, he hates me saying stuff like that. But we're going to do The Blues, which was written by uh, the famous Jim Self. And I uh, hope you like this. And again, thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure, and, and I hope you, you enjoyed yourself. These euphonium players love playing fast. It's just ridiculous.
All right, good afternoon, everybody. We're back. Sergeant First Class Tom Brad, tour player here in the United States Army Band, Pershing Zone. Uh, this is what we call affectionately tuba week in Pershing Zone, where we have tuba euphonium players from all over the world. Hey, man, how you doing? Some of you may have been watching online already on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash US Army Band. Uh, tonight, we're featuring the U.S. Army Blues with uh, star John Sass on tuba. So joining me right now is uh, Tim Busby, who's the principal tuba player in the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. And then I get, I'll let you introduce yourself. Why don't you introduce our other guests? Yeah, sure. Uh, here on my right, we have Tavigby Baldwinson from Iceland. He actually composed the piece that I'm the concerto that I'm preparing tomorrow with the Army Band Symphony Orchestra. So it's, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Tavigby join us all the way from Iceland. So you've written that piece for tomorrow. You've written a concert. What, 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 how would you describe it? Well, uh, it's a piece called Persistence. And it is, it is actually uh, just about depression. And uh, about my daughter. How oh, yeah, someone you can see that, that you wish yeah. <laughs> is actually depressed and pushed down. Now you all met while you were in Iceland, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I met Tavigby when we, me and my family lived in uh, Iceland, playing with the Iceland Symphony Orchestra. Uh, Tavigby is actually a tuba player, oh, uh, and composer, and pianist. And uh, so, yeah, I, I uh, grabbed him right away and said, you got to write a tuba concerto. So you said that took a lot of convincing, or well, was it just a few beers? And, you know, is there an Icelandic beer that he particularly likes? <laughs> well, uh, actually, I was at a party yes. when you called me. There you go. <laughs> and of course, I said yes. yes. <laughs> well, we're really looking forward to the performance. Now, you've got an interesting accent for an Australian. Now, why, what, what is it about your accent that maybe an Australian? A little bit different. Tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, well, originally I'm from the Northern Territory uh, in the upper. You know, I'm originally from Texas, but lived in many, many different countries. And this is what's left of my Texas accent. Uh, most people in Australia think I'm Canadian, which blows my mind, but that's the way it is. So. And you've been in Melbourne since 2010? <laughs> 2010. And I think the last time you were in Melbourne was right as you were. Transitioning to Bill. That's right. Won the job, and uh, so last time we were here was in 2011. We we had I've already won the job, but we had not quite moved there yet. Now, uh, if you followed the 2B20 workshop, you know we bring in a lot of artists from around the world. It's not a great that invitation to come back. Uh, well, that's kind of my favorite. Yeah. 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 You're in an elite category of some of the finest brass yeah. players in the world to get an invitation back. To so it's really pleasure to have you. So if you all want to watch this performance, it's a world premiere. So if you're in Iceland, it's that how many hours in that? It's a five hours. So we're playing at 7.30. Just after, just after so you can watch it on youtube.com slash US Army Band. Uh, make sure to share this with all your two and your friends, all your brass player friends. We're really excited to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. Uh, feel, uh, feel free to keep coming in. We don't love a full audience. So thank you for coming. I uh, just have a couple uh, actually announcements for you guys. Uh, some of you have probably heard before, but just in case. Uh, the first is Armed Forces To Be Funny Ensemble rehearsal uh, is today, and it's going to be at 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And also there's a rehearsal tomorrow at 3 o'clock, and the performance will be at uh, 3 o'clock. So those that are in the military and want to perform uh, with the AFTI uh, To Be Funny Ensemble, please join us uh, this evening at 6 o'clock. Uh, with the rehearsal tomorrow and also uh, performance on Saturday. Uh, also, uh, the exhibits, one of their favorite parts of the, of the conference here, uh, if they open tomorrow at, at noon, and it goes from noon to 5.30. Uh, on Saturday, it'll open at 9, and it closes at 5.30. And lastly, uh, just a couple of social things. Uh, tomorrow evening after the orchestra concert, we will have a bowling night. Uh, unofficially, but uh, uh, bow bowling night. Uh, let's see, we'll have uh, several lanes reserved for all of us, so it'll be enough for everyone there, and so it's right uh, just a, basically a block and a half from here. So feel free to join us then, and then uh, after Saturday evening's concert, uh, where you actually go to the exhibits to try out the instruments, we'll have a reception for everyone there, so make sure and come back and join us for that uh, reception after their uh, Saturday evening's concert. Uh, without any further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Scott Roeder and, uh, uh, and, and to be a funny mouth home. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We are the Tubi Phoneme Ensemble from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Uh, for those of you that don't know where that is, um, basically you go to San Antonio and you go south until you run out of country, and that's where we're at. Uh, we're about 20 minutes from the Mexican border um, the, in Edinburgh, Texas. The first piece you heard was uh, Leonard Bernstein's Overture to Candide. The next four pieces we're going to play is a series of, of, of uh, tunes all from Latin music, inspired uh, jazz tunes, traditional tunes. Um, so I hope you enjoy that. The first piece we're going to play is uh, Chick Corea's Spain.
arrangements were, uh, were done by a member of this group, uh, Miguel Montano, did both the last two arrangements. <laughs> that last piece was Children of Sanchez, by the way, by Chuck Mangione. The next piece we're going to play is a more traditional uh, Latin tune. This is, uh, you hear it on the marching band field all the time, this is Malaganya.
So we have one more piece left in our in our Latin set, so to speak, and this is going to um, this is going to feature a, a soloist this time. Um, I'd like to uh, um, Chris Buckley, uh, member of the euphonium member in the Army Band, is going to play with us. Uh, I've known Chris for a long time through things in Texas, and he's actually from South Texas, although a little farther up the river in Laredo. Uh, some people call it the Valley. Some people don't. It depends who you talk to. Um, but but uh, we're excited to get an opportunity to perform this piece with Chris. So without further ado, I'd like to bring out Chris Buckley, and this is La Virgen de la Macarena. Thank you. 
piece we're going to play is the only piece in the program that was actually written for two euphonium ensemble. Everything else on the program is an arrangement or a transcription of some some sort. Uh, with a bu with actually a bunch of the bunch of the pieces actually aren't published arrangements, which is kind of cool. I like I like doing new things that aren't haven't been done before. But this is actually a world premiere. Uh, Gravity is a piece by Dr. Justin Ryder. Uh, Justin, if you're watching on YouTube. Thank you for writing such a wonderful piece. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, this is He's the uh, professor of theory and composition at UT Rio Grande Valley. And this is a, uh, he wrote this specifically for this conference when I told him we were going. He's like, I want to write you a piece. And I was like, fantastic. Uh, this is a series of ensemble pieces. It's in a whole line of series of like uh, elements, water, fire, things like that. Um, and what else for to be euphonium ensemble, but gravity. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 
Next, we're going to perform uh, what has become a very standard of the 2B phoneme ensemble repertoire. Uh, this is the three Brooklyn motets arranged by John Stevens. You'll hear this all, all over the place now. Uh, we're going to perform the second and third movements of this. <coughs> Thank you. 
Thank you all very much. We have one more piece that we're going to play for you today. Uh, this is um, an arrangement of Light Calvary Overture. This arrangement was done by Luis Maldonado, and we wanted to play this today to kind of honor Luis. Luis was an alumnus and a graduate of uh, UT Pan American, which is the former uh, the school that was uh, existed before our current school. We, uh, we had a merger a couple years ago and changed the name. But Luis is an alumnus and grew up in South Texas, and, and uh, so we wanted to honor him by playing his arrangement of Light Calvary Overture. Before we do, Thank you all for coming out today. It's been such a pleasure to play for you, and thank you to the uh, Army Band and the 2B Euphonium section for hosting this conference and inviting us out. And also thank you to uh, UT Rio Grande Valley for uh, helping us uh, support this trip with some travel funds and things like that. So uh, hope you enjoy the last piece.
Thank you.